Hello? Oh, Johnny Dollar. Johnny, listen, Johnny. Oh, hold it. What? Well, let me switch on this bed lamp. No, listen, Johnny. Are you there? Oh, there we are. Hello? Yeah. Listen, this is Terry Holmes. You know, Star Mutual Insurance. Well, at this hour... Listen, will you? I'm at a party, or what was a party. I want you to come over here right away. Oh, thanks, Terry, but I just had one. No, no, you don't understand, Johnny. I understand that unless I get some sleep, we're going to feel mighty lousy in the morning. Johnny, this is... 2 a.m.? Yes. Put on some clothes and get over here right away. Get over where? The Chadwick residence. Mr. and Mrs. Bruno Chadwick. Out here on Wethersfield Avenue. You know, out of ways beyond Colt Park. Chadwick? Yes. That great big mansion that... Yes, yes, that's the one. The big colonial job that sits back from the street about a quarter of a... Well, well, you know where it is, so come on. Well, who got murdered? Nobody. But the company will probably murder me if we have to pay off all the claims on this... Well, one. now, what kind of claims? On what, Terry? On the biggest jewel robbery that has ever been pulled in this town. Happened just four, five, six minutes ago. Have you called the police? Yes, we've called the police. Now, get out of here, will you? Johnny. All right, Terry. All right. Right away. <laughs> CBS Radio Network brings you Bob Reddick in the exciting adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator, yours truly, Johnny Dollar. <laughs> expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar. To the Star Mutual Insurance Company, Home Office, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of the touch-up matter. <laughs> Expense account item one, lack of sleep. I hauled myself out of bed, got dressed in a hurry, and then used my own car to drive to the Bruno Chadwick south of town just off Wethersfield Avenue. Mansion is right. The big old home is one of the local show places. Must have 35 or 40 rooms. It's just as good as the day it was built. Instead of the butler, Terry Holmes let me in the front door. He led me across the marble floor of the entrance hall and then into a huge mahogany panel library. Okay, now sit down, Johnny. And let me tell you what's happened. All right. Well, hadn't I better check in with the police? Who's in charge? Lieutenant Barney McQuaid. But now listen. Now, where are they? In the music room with the Chadwicks and all their guests. But I can tell you what's happened in half the time it would take you to get it out there with all those excited, chattering females all trying to talk at once. You should hear them, yakety, yakety, yakety. Oh, what females, Terry? This party's the Chadwick's 40th wedding anniversary. The guest list, and I don't know how I ever happened to be on it. Well, the guests include most of the ritziest, wealthiest people in Hartford. Real big money. Mr. and Mrs. Lloyd Augustus Brownfield, for instance. Oh, the stock market millions? Yes, and the Fritz Melchiors, the Lawrence Comstocks, Kenneth Gordon Hodge, that old dowager Marianne Hooper, half a dozen more. Just think of money and you've got the whole list. Except for Mr. Thompson B. Thompson. Who is he? Who knows? He barged in early this evening, just about the time the festivities were getting underway. Said he was up from New York and staying at the Pearson Motor Court. You know, the other side of town? Yeah, I know the place. Okay. Said he wanted to talk over a business deal with old man Chadwick. Apologized for not having made a date with him. And when he saw there was a party in progress, he apologized again and said he'd come back another time. But Mrs. Chadwick took one look at him, and believe me, Johnny, this was the polished gentleman of... Well, if there ever was one. And good-looking, too. Yeah. Well, she talked with him a minute or so and then insisted he join the party. So he did. What's more, he was the life of the party. And that's why it lasted so late. Tall, young, handsome, charming. Uh, all those wealthy old biddies practically fought each other for a chance to talk with him, sit next to him. And all the while, Johnny, that stinker was carefully casing the hundreds of thousands in jewelry they were loaded with. So how did he pull it off, Terry? We were all sitting around in the music room trying to keep politely awake while Mrs. Price, Mrs. Jackson Lee Kenworthy Price, squawked out the 10th or 15th encore in that crow-like voice of hers. Believe me, Johnny, it was murder. Well, onward and upward with the arts. Oh, sure. Anyhow, while everybody was quietly shuddering over an impromptu condenser, she was thoroughly mangling somewhere in the middle of uh, our sweet mystery of life, I think it was. I wouldn't swear to it. Yeah. Suddenly, the lights went out. Go on. Well, for about three seconds, there was some blessed silence for a change. 
And then old lady Chadwick let out a shriek that was even worse than Mrs. Price's singing and started hollering about her diamond necklace. Then Mary Ann Hooper yelled something about her emerald pendant. Then three or four of the others all practically on top of each other. By the time old Chadwick got the lights back on again, that charming, lovable Mr. Thompson B. Thompson was gone. And with him, nearly two million bucks in jewelry. Any police been able to find out anything about this, Thompson? Well, not very much. Not yet. What? How are you, Johnny? Well, hi, Lieutenant. Boy, you should hear him in there, Johnny. Holy smoke, they sound like a yard full of chickens with an army of hawks descending on them. That's pretty good, Lieutenant. So I thought I'd hole up in here until one of the boys I sent over to that motel checks back with me. Uh, the motel where this Thompson B. Thompson claimed he was staying? Yeah, that's right. Didn't you phone the place? Yes, and the manager told me that he's registered all right and drives the same kind of a car he used to come over here. I see New York, yes, No, that's just the point. Connecticut plates. Uh, that could... Maybe that's Conroy now. Mind if I listen in? Be my guest. McQuaid. Conroy, Lieutenant. Yes, Conroy. Those plates. Yeah? The manager here gave me the number on them. Yeah? I checked them with headquarters, Lieutenant. They're on the stolen car list. I see. Then there's no point in your staying there at the motel. No, sir. I guess he's far away, but... Hey, hold everything, Lieutenant. Yes? Hello, Conroy. Listen, car just came in the driveway. Looks like his, maybe. Yes? Uh, yeah, yeah. He's pulling up in front of number seven. That's Thompson's room. Okay, now, as soon as he gets inside, go out and check that license. Call me back. Don't try to apprehend him. Right, sir. Call me back. Well... May not be so tough at that. Wonderful. Sounds like a cinch. Sure. And yet if he was clever enough to crack this party the way he did. Lieutenant, did the people inside there give you a pretty good description of him? Description? Better than that. Look at this. A snapshot of him. Good. How'd you happen to get this? Hey, I remember. Right after dinner, Mr. Chadwick took a lot of these pictures with one of those self-developing cameras. Yeah, that's right. He was snapping everybody, handing them out right and left. Well, Thompson didn't object to having his picture taken? No, oh, jumped at the chance. Funny. Now, if Conroy calls back and says that... There we go, John. I'll listen over your shoulder again. McQuaid. Conroy again, Lieutenant. That's Thompson's car, all right. I mean, the one he stole. All right, now, Conroy. That's Thompson, one inside the motel room. Looks just like that picture you got. He's in there now. Okay. Don't disturb him. What do you mean? I mean, don't disturb him. Unless he tries to make a break for it. Then stop him any way you have to. Yes, sir. I'll be right over. Okay, Johnny. Want to be in on an easy kill? Easy kill, huh? Absolutely. Any bets? The lieutenant, one of his men, and I hopped into a prowl car and tore on over to the Pearson Motor Court, going into the driveway as quietly as possible with the lights off. Conroy was there, he was waiting, and he led us over to in front of unit number seven. You're sure he's still in there, Conroy? Yes, sir. I see. There's a stolen car, still there. Oh, hi, Chris. Hi. Look, Lieutenant, you can see him moving around inside. I mean, a shadow against the shade. Maybe packing up for a fast getaway. All right, now, I'll take the door. Conroy, you cover me on this side. Chris, you and Mr. Dollarkin... What am I talking about? Listen, Johnny, you have no business being in on this. If Thompson gets rough, if he's armed... So what? Go ahead. Start pounding on the door. It'll be on your own responsibility. So I'm a very responsible guy. Now, go ahead with him. Okay. I'll be careful. You too, Chris. Thompson? Come on, Thompson. We know you're in there. Open up. This is the police, Thompson. You open this door, or do we shoot our way in? Well? Boys, hit the door. Okay, Lieutenant. All right, Thompson, come on. So what the devil? Well, Lieutenant, it looks as though a bird has flown the coop. The shadow I saw from the outside. Here, Chris. On top of this lamp. This little pinwheel affair. Yes, you're right, Johnny. Heat from the lamp makes it turn, cause the moving shadow that we saw there on the window shade. Well, I'll be a monkey's uncle. Well, here's how he got out, Lieutenant. Put this open window back here. Yes, for once, you're right, Conroy. Question is when. 
Well, now, what do you know? Maybe I'd better go out and keep an eye on his car, Lieutenant. Yeah, I'll do that, Chris. Well, Conroy, thanks to your stupidity. Oh, now, Lieutenant. Okay, okay, I'll have to admit you couldn't watch both sides of this place at once. Anyhow, our friend Thompson is safely away with four necklaces, one emerald pendant, one bracelet, one brooch, Lieutenant. Yes, that's exactly what... Dollar. Charlie, where'd you get those? Lying here on the floor, under the table. Anything missing? Three. Pendant. Did you know the emerald in this thing is worth nearly half a million, Johnny? I can believe it. And this. This. Oh, this son of a gun. It's all here. You know why, Lieutenant? Because he must have somehow found out that I was outside, keeping an eye on him. So what happens? He knows he can't get away with it, so he drops the loot and he makes a break. I hate to admit it, Conroy, but you're probably right. For once, your stupidity paid off. Oh, Lieutenant, what do you mean, my stupidity? Well, possibly what the Lieutenant means is the way you parked your police car right there at the side of the driveway huh? where Thompson couldn't but see it when he drove here. Oh, 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 well... Don't do bother think? with excuses, Conroy. There are none for a boner like that. Yes, sir. Well... We get this stuff back to the owners? The wealthy old ladies were tickled pink to get their expensive baubles back. And a look of relief on Terry Holmes' face was really something to behold. He'd been quietly sitting alone in the library, adding up the two million odd dollars he thought his company would have to pay out. But there was nothing quiet about the music room. Yes, well, thank you, ladies, thank you. But now the, the boys and I had better... You're go wonderful, Mr. Dollar. I just don't know how you did it. Oh, I just knew when Mr. Holmes said he was bringing you into the case, I just knew you'd get our things back. Well, right? now, look, Miss Chadwick, the real credit for this should yes, go... Yes, sir. I just told the lieutenant, Mr. Dollar, we're certainly proud of you. Well, now, Mr. Chadwick, I... If there's anything I can do for you any old time... Just you ask for it, my boy. And you did it all so quickly. It's just wonderful. Well, now, you're sure they're all here, Mrs. Chadwick? No stones missing, anything like that? We've checked them, every single one. Well, good. You're just wonderful, Mr. Dollar. Well, I wish you ladies would thank the lieutenant if he and his men hadn't got there so quickly. Oh, uh... now, you're too modest, Mr. Dollar. No, 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 it's a fact. Just because I happen to see the jewelry lying there for... Well, uh, you tell them how it happened, lieutenant. Well, the boys and I are going to get back to headquarters, folks. Oh, but not before you tell us all the details. Oh, yeah. Yes, please, lieutenant. Tell us just exactly. Well, now, now, please, please. Oh, Come in. Come in. Sit down. I was just about to go out and rescue you, Johnny. Oh, Terry, you still here? Yeah, I kind of thought you'd get your fill of that yakety yak out there. Want the butler to fix you a drink? Just push that little pink button on the desk. Well, you're real happy now, aren't you, Terry? Why not? Look at the money the company won't have to pay out now. Order a drink. Hey, call the lieutenant in for one. Lord knows he deserves it. Uh, he'll need more than a drink when he gets time to realize the big part of his job is still to be done. Now, what do you mean by that? I mean running down this Thompson character. Who cares about him now, now that the stuff is back? I it? do, for one. And you know something? I got a couple of ideas. Oh? Like what? Well, take that picture of him. Oh, uh, beg your pardon. This picture. I forgot to give it back to the lieutenant. Looks exactly like him, Johnny. Tall, slim, kind of ramrod. I mean, that straight sort of military bearing, slick black hair, neatly trimmed mustache. That's the guy. Almost pretty, though, isn't he? Almost like he used makeup to look younger than he really is. Why not? Didn't those old biddies out there really flip over him? And he didn't mind having his picture taken. Why? Don't ask me. And why did he tell everybody where he was staying? He certainly knew he was going to pull this job. Hey, you're right. And another thing, too. What's that, Johnny? Where was he between the time he left here and when he finally arrived at the motel? Mm -hmm. That policeman, Conroy, had plenty of time to get there before Thompson did. What's more, he didn't hesitate to calmly walk into his room in spite of a prowl car parked outside. Hey, right. And why did he go back to the motel at all? Yeah. Yeah, that is kind of funny. Sure it is. And it all adds up to one big, fat, powerful hunch. Hooray. So what are you going to do, Johnny? Well, first of all, since your company has it all so nicely insured, I'm going to borrow that jewelry. Huh? Just until sometime tomorrow morning, Terry. I don't think anything will happen to it. Well, it better not. Go on in there and pry it loose from all those gabby old ladies for me, will you? Go on, Terry. Now, what's the matter? Okay, whatever you say, Johnny, but I sure hope you know what you're doing. Yeah? So do I. At 
9.30 the next morning, I dropped in at the small store of a jeweler by the name of Caldwell. His eyes almost bugged out of his head when I casually laid the pile of trinkets on the counter and asked for an appraisal. But when he put a loop in his eye and started to examine them really carefully... No, no, I can't believe it. Amazing, so beautiful. But I can't believe it, Mr. Dollar. You can't believe what? Paste imitations, but... The... Most magnificent imitations I ever saw. It's a game time. And the setting's the work of an artist. Sure, a game time. Uh, what? He knew that nobody would ever question these until they were sent in to be cleaned, whatever that might be. Well, I don't understand, sir. So he'd have all the time he needed to leave town quietly without any excitement or any suspicion. Uh, Mr. Dollar, this uh, switch might not be realized for months. Well, I'm afraid I don't understand. Huh? Good morning, Lieutenant. Oh, Mr. Caldwell, uh, Dollar, I've been looking all over for you. Yes, and knowing I had the jewels with me, started looking in all the jewelry stores. That's right. Well, I hope not too many of them. What? Here, would you like to return these to the owners now? Well, sure, only really, Except I... for Mrs. Chadwick's. So I'll take her necklace back myself. I'll see you, Lieutenant. Well, now, wait a second, I'm Charlie. sorry, but I don't think I'd better well, waste any time. No, oh, uh, Mr. Uh, Caldwell, maybe you'd better tell him about those jewels. I certainly shall. Huh? Now, Johnny! <laughs> You know, from that moment on, things slipped so neat into place I could hardly believe it. First, of course, I returned the necklace to Mrs. Chadwick, without telling her, not yet, that her stuff was only paste. And I only wish there was something I could do to show my gratitude. Well, there is, Mrs. Chadwick. Well, what's that, Mr. Dollar? Well, I'd like to borrow that camera that makes the pictures right after you snap them. Why, of course. Also, I'd like to know where you have this fine jewelry clean. Oh, at Richter's, that big place on High Street. We wouldn't think of taking them anywhere else. We? Oh, yes, all the ladies you met last night. Oh, thank you very much. What? At the big jewelry house on High Street, I showed my credentials to Mr. Richter himself and told him what it was all about. He was a bit shook up for a moment, and then he led me into a large, well-lighted shop at the rear. Eighteen or twenty highly skilled craftsmen were bent over individual tables, covered with little layers and grinding wheels and lots of equipment that I'd never seen before. They were creating, or cleaning and repairing, various pieces of fine jewelry, or drawing designs for pieces yet to be made. Richter told the men to pay no attention to me as I walked among them, taking pictures, supposedly a magazine article. And finally, we stopped at the bench of a lean, rather bald man of middle age who was hunched over a vice, where he was mounting a huge ruby in a ring. And uh, this is Ernest, uh, fairly new with us, but one of our finest stone setters. Designs and makes all the mountings himself. Ernest? Uh, don't let us interrupt your work, Ernest. Oh, thank you, sir. Uh, we're going to miss you, though, when you leave for that job in uh, Philadelphia, is it? Yes, sir. Uh, but I'll be here another week or so, Mr. Rick. Oh, yes, that's right, that's right. I think I'd like your pictures standing up, Ernest. Standing, sir? Yes, if you don't mind. Do you? Why, uh, no, of course not, sir. Uh, right next to Mr. Richter, please. And uh, stand up straight, huh? Uh, I'm afraid that bending over my work all these years... Oh, come on, stand up straight, like this. I beg your pardon. Good, that'll do it. Uh, Mr. Richter, might I ask what this is all about? Now, we'll give this about a minute. I'm afraid I don't understand, well, sir. Well, don't worry, Ernest, you will. Now, Mr. Richter, yes? as soon as this picture develops, if one of your artists will do a little retouching for me... Well, of course, Mr. Dollar. What? Mr. Dollar? That's right, Johnny Dollar. The investigator. Yes. Retouching... You said? To put a sort of wig on this picture of your slick black hair and a trim little mustache, maybe a dark suit. I see. Now, I kind of think it'll match the other one, the one that Mr. Chadwick took of you at his party last night, don't you, Ernest? Or is it Thompson B. Thompson? Why, Ernest, what's the matter? You don't look well. Mr. Dollar knows why. Real clever, wasn't it, huh? Get all that priceless jewelry in here for cleaning and make those perfect copies. And then in your makeup and dark suit, you stole the real ones last night, left the phonies behind, and really threw the police off the track. And let's get this picture out of here so we can prove the disguise that you use. No, it uh, won't be necessary, Mr. Dollar. Oh? Uh, 
As they say in the movies, I'll go along quietly. The gems he'd stolen, how he picked them up at apartments, and then took them along to police headquarters. It's funny. Lieutenant McQuaid even forgot to ball me out for having kept that first picture of Ernest. Expense account total? What expense accounts? But believe me, I want a nice fee on this one. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. our star to tell you about next week's story. For next week, what might have been a pleasant trip across the country, if it weren't for a killer gunning for me. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Reddick, is written by Jack Johnstone, produced and directed by Bruno Zerato Jr. Musical supervision by Ethel Huber. Heard in our cast in order of their appearance were Jim Stevens, Carl Frank, Lawson Zerby, Bill Lipton, Elspeth Eric, Gene Gillespie, Guy Rep, Raymond Edward Johnson, Louis Van Ruten, and Bob Dryden. Be sure to join us next week, same time, same station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. This is Wally King speaking.